All right, guys, just because uh, my son is still napping, hopefully it'll last the length of this lab. I wanted to return back to kind of my clinical roots. You know, my, my personal blog and even before that with kettlebell therapy has been very, you know, clinically oriented until I got involved in, you know, more of the, uh, you know, vocalization of where the strategy and the future of physical therapy should be and, and stuff like that. And I was just kind of thinking and looking at my to-do list and I realized that I had a nice little case uh, and story on how I got into uh, you know the vestibular world, my first BPPV case, how that relates to the emergency room or department rather, and being a PT there, piloting that out, uh, and uh, and how I like to beat up MRI machines. So uh, this is how it starts. So I uh, I graduated in 09 and I went to work for a hospital, and you know just like everybody says. Uh, go to the hospital because you have all that major medical, uh, not major medical, but you have a lot of that medical uh, background there, all that resource, all the other disciplines. It's one of the best places to really learn your medicine uh, and start out as a new grad. So, you know, I heeded that advice and went for it. The irony was that I had a mentor that was assigned to me, and then that mentor actually left the de department pretty quickly after I, I signed on board. So I had to kind of fend for myself. And as that approached, what ended up happening was there was a, a new eval that was sent over to the short stay observation um, wing, which is kind of the next bump level up uh, from the emergency room uh, department uh, in case you, uh, you know, the physicians or the team doesn't think uh, that it's going to be worth to stay there and you might be, you know, 24 to 48 hours or even perhaps admitted to inpatient, uh, you go there as kind of a holding area uh, or if you're, you know, there for an outpatient procedure, you're coded as outpatient. Uh, so in any case, there was a 90 year old, you know, gal fell ridiculously dizzy, scared out of her wits. And, uh, you know, we got this referral as, you know, eval and treat BPPV. And, uh, I, <laughs> my lead sent out this, uh, this text page going, so anybody want to do vestibular? And at the, at the time there was nobody that did vestibular, uh, at the department, uh, it was just kind of something we punted off to the uh, outpatient neuro rehab specialists. And being fresh out of school, I was blessed and, and very uh, fortunate to have a very strong neuro background uh, in my curriculum, including uh, you know the treatment of vestibular disorders. And so uh, I was like, well, you know, I'll, I'll take a shot. You know, the because the, the you know the, the nursing manager and the physician they were all very you know angry that you know we got to get somebody in there right now because I want to discharge, get them out, that kind of stuff. So I got in there and this poor little thing, she's, you know, like five, one, less than a hundred pounds, uh, you know, just dizzy as all can be scared to move completely just terrified to, to move any, her head in any direction. And we go through the gambit, you know, the Dick's hall pike, all that kind of stuff, all the usual assessments, you know, you check the VOR, the balance, all that stuff. And it's pretty obvious. It's a classical, uh, you know, posterior canal thiasis. And so I explained to her, like, look, uh, we're, we're lucky, but we're unlucky. We're lucky because we have a hospital bed that tilts. We're still unlucky because we're still going to have to, <laughs> we're still going to do this maneuver, uh, which requires you to do a lot of rolling. So she's, oh no, rolling. It's, you know, it's the end of the world as it is. And, uh, you know, after some, you know, coaxing and some convincing and just kind of getting down to her level and say, hey, look, this, this is scary. I get it. Uh, but, you know, I'm 99% sure I know what this is, you know, and if I'm right, you didn't have a stroke. You know, you're not having a heart attack and all that stuff's being ruled out. This is the last, you know, leg of the race. And if I'm right, this will probably be the last time you'll have to deal with this, uh, pending that you don't, you know, go on a roller coaster or something. So I uh, would do the maneuver on her. And what I actually ended up doing was I ended up using the tilt table function of the hospital bed to get her to the, the proper incline so that she didn't have to completely flex up her cervical spine. Just she wouldn't be able to do it at 90 something. And uh, we did the re repositioning and afterward, you know, I, I sat her up. I was like, okay, just stay here for a second. Don't move. I know you like to move. Just don't move. And we tried ambulating the hallway and so on and so forth. She's oh my gosh, I'm, I'm healed. And she was all very happy about it. And then we sent her back to her CCRC. What ended up happening with that was I learned two things. Uh, number one, you don't have to have all the experience in the world to help people. I mean, yes, you need exposure, either workplace exposure, clinical exposure, exposure to kind of this patient populace uh, to make sure that you you know enough that you won't cause any harm uh, and that you can be confident and that you can get the right kind of results consistently. 
But at the same time, you know, you don't have to be the all out expert to help people. You know, if you know enough and you're confident that your diagnosis is correct and you're confident that your, your intervention is correct, you know, and it won't do any harm, then it won't do any harm, right? It can only help. And that might not be the most scientific of approaches, but you know, healthcare isn't hundred percent scientific. It's, it's humanistic really, right? It's, we're dealing people to people. It's just that one person on one side of the aisle happens to be a healthcare provider, right? They're licensed. They have went to school and they went under a certain amount of training to do what they do and they get paid for it, hopefully. And the other person is a consumer of that, right? And, and sometimes they're kind of the victim of that situation. They're, they're not asking to be here. At least most of them aren't, but they are, and it's your job to take care of them. So that's number one. You don't have to have all the experience in the world because this was probably within the first three months of me being a new grad, right? And no one else wanted this BPPV patient. Nobody felt comfortable doing vestibular. I did. And, you know, the situation added up where uh, it all worked out. I got in there and, you know, either I got lucky or I did things right or both. So as that pervaded, you know, through the next couple of uh, months, years, et cetera, I found myself becoming the primary vestibular PT for acute care. Just by de facto, right? Because I was the only person that felt comfortable enough, and I started getting better and better at it. Uh, took a weekend course, like many people do, and realized that for the most part, I actually still had much of that down back from school. And that eventually led to me uh, doing some piloting for emergency uh, acute care PT, getting into the ED, and uh, trying to differentiate out certain things. Uh, a lot of back pain stuff and a lot of dizziness. That seemed to be the big thing. Just okay, back pain, surgery non-surgery, outpatient, inpatient, and then same with um, dizziness and falls was if there's concerns of strokes uh, or anything of that nature, more um, you know, maniacal vestibular concerns. And that's where uh, the beating up of MRI machines came up was uh, perhaps my very favorite case you know, that I've experienced that really highlights the differential diagnosis capabilities of this next generation of physical therapists, you know, educated at the doctorate level. Uh, is the following. So I had this, uh, this family visiting from out of state and they, uh, you know, they're just doing their thing, visiting family here uh, in town. And then the husband takes a crazy fall, made no sense. Just where he was made no sense why he would have fallen. Nothing. He just did tumbled. Like somebody pulled the rug out from under him, sent him to the emergency room, did a cat scan scan was negative admitted him to uh, the neuro floor for further testing and further testing demonstrated negative uh, MRI completely negative. He's fine. So in comes the vestibular PT eval and treat. I come in there and I take a look at him and nothing is right. Like he has nystagmus is out of control. It goes in every possible direction. It's not, it's not directional nor positional. And uh, his coordination is beyond crazy is he couldn't stand. He couldn't progress limbs. But of course, what happened right in the ED, raise your arm, resist, raise your other arm, resist, kick out your leg, same thing, right? Uh, wiggle your toes. All those gross functions are fine in the emergency department when tested by somebody who's not a physical therapist. And then when you add on that bias of, okay, CAT scan negative, MRI negative, then it can't be a stroke, right? There's no possible way. So if you fell and you're dizzy, then it has to be from the inner ear. That's what the, the system is thinking, right? The process with the various uh, clinicians involved. But when I got there, it just didn't make any sense, right? This truly wasn't vestibular in nature. Uh, and it's just, you know, there's all these different signs about, you know, like the, the amount of time, the, uh, the, Snagbus was present, was well over a minute. So it's not positional. There's all these atastic concerns. And the giveaway point for me was uh, Horner syndrome. So that is, uh, you know, th three parts. It's you have facial drooping, uh, you know, ocular drooping, and then a difference in uh, pupillary dilation. And uh, when I saw that, I was like, that's odd. And I just, you know, I looked at him, you know, <laughs> I, was, I was looking at the wife and I looked at him and there's, you know, I was like, uh, can I take a, uh, you know, look at your cell phone? just for a picture of him, you know, earlier, I just wanted to see, you know, is this really what he looks like and that kind of stuff. And, you know, sure enough, it, it was there ever so present, that really tiny bit of Horner syndrome. So I looked back into the MRI, I already took a quick look at it, but I trusted the neural, uh, not the neurologist, but the uh, radiologist, like, okay, it has to be negative. So I'm flipping through everything. And sure enough, uh, everything in the cerebrum is fine. 
I was like, well, let me look down a little bit, right? Ataxic stuff that's usually cerebellum, could be brainstem. So I looked down a little bit and sure enough, big hole, you have your, you know, cerebellum right here and a hole about that big in comparison to, you know, a picture that size, uh, demonstrated, a, a, you know, there's something interesting going on, right? I'm not going to diagnose it as a DPT, but I can certainly say that doesn't look quite normal and combine that with Horner syndrome. I think we have something. And so I, uh, I remember just from way back in the day, you know, in the books, if you have Horner syndrome and you have that kind of vestibular look and there's some ataxia involved, it very likely is a pica syndrome, a posterior inferior cerebellar artery stroke. And I asked him, Hey, is there any kind of hearing problems, right? You, you kind of go back there again in acute care, you move really fast and you go back there and go, okay, well, you know, how's your hearing? How's your hearing? Hearing's fine. You know, I really think you have a pica stroke. And so I go to the nurse and the same thing happens. And I look at, Hey, do you see what I see? Right. I, I, I pull up the Wikipedia of Hornish. Here it is over here. Here's our guy. Are they the same? And you know, yeah, 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 kind of. So, you know, I show him the MRI, show my theory. And after a bunch of, uh, embattlement with, uh, various providers, uh, and, uh, you know, some uh, fairly aggressive calls <laughs> down at MRI. We got him down there again. Did the MRI again. And of course, it's the exact same image. The stroke is there, but this time it is diagnosed as there. Uh, and that got me thinking, you know, the, the story wraps up as we finally advocated enough for the guy that despite him being out of state, everything worked out. He went to acute neuro rehab. I think it was uh, six to eight weeks. Uh, drove home, finished outpatient neuro rehab. I actually ended up having a dinner with the family you know, months later and he's doing great. So, you know, it's a yay, it's a yay PT story, right? Get PT first, that whole thing. But it made me realize something, um, both on a physiological level, as well as a, uh, kind of a healthcare medical practice, uh, pattern level. You know, most MRIs take one centimeter slices, right? Given the direction. But when you're taking a look at such small strokes, right? Sub, uh, subcerebral, you may miss it just as easy as that because you're in between the slices, right? You keep taking one centimeter slices. If you have a really, really, really tiny area of sclera damage or, or infarct, you're not going to see it. And you're definitely not going to see it with a CAT scan, right? This is purely clinical. And that's how it was diagnosed, right? I had to go in there as a vestibular PT, fail out of all of that, recognize certain telltale signs to call it a pica syndrome, to have it reconfirmed by an MRI that already demonstrated the area of damage prior. <sighs> you know, all to say, you know, this is an area that I think needs to be really developed in healthcare. There's some leaders out there already doing it, you know, far more capable and more involved than I am because, right, I'm right now I'm in the, uh, the business and media production uh, side of PT, but those that are in the front lines. And if you're in acute care or if you're interested in doing per diem stuff, you know, you might want to take a look at that. It's a very exciting place to truly apply the differential diagnosis skills that DPTs are trained with. And let me tell you, it is significant, absolutely significant how good we are at physical diagnosis compared to any other provider out there. And in experience levels too, and exposure levels of, you know, coll collegial PTs, you know, I, I would argue to say that uh, you know, 20 years ago and even 10 years ago with the masters, that generation and culture of PT was trained for treatment. They are phenomenal clinicians when it comes to treatment, right? Our generation right now is the DPT is progressing. We're pushing direct access. We're pushing to become uh, physician extenders and or primary care providers, even physician status through CMS. The treatment aspect kind of has to take a little bit of a back burner because we need to be sure that we can provide the proper medical screening for emergencies. And so now our differential diagnosis skills have really gone up and that's not a bad thing. You know, it's, it's a shift. You can't have everything. You can't be pro diagnose, uh, you know, the pro diagnoses, um, and pro treatment and get the same quality. There's going to be some give and take. And that's, again, it's okay. Later in your career, you can build up the area you feel is a little weaker. Um, that's what those medical screening courses are all about. You know, I went to one and, you know, again, I felt pretty much like I walked in and walked out with the same amount of information, but you can definitely see different generations of PTs have various levels of comfort and discomfort uh, with medical screening and differential diagnosis. Um, so yeah, you know the the uh, the the story time of that arc of me taking on uh, the BPPV case uh, as the 
new grad PT, only one willing to even try a vestibular case into being the primary vestibular PT for the acute care hospital into, you know, this whole thing where I'm embattled with MRIs because they don't necessarily show everything. That's the second part, you know, other than the slices, there are certain areas of the brain. I feel that you know, the infarcts and the damage is so small that you don't either see it immediately or you won't see it at all because of the, just the size of damage. So that's where I think, you know, if you're watching, if you're a physician, a nurse, a physical therapist, you know, one of our fellow rehab therapists, you know, speech or occupational doesn't really matter, right? I think just as healthcare providers, as clinicians, we need to start looking at our patient a little bit more uh, and looking at the screen a little bit less because the screen will only tell us so much, right? Like lab values will only tell us so much. I can tell you horror stories of certain RIs that I've seen and certain lab values, you know, like INRs that should be, you know, like it's basically Ebola. This guy should be bleeding inside out, but he's not, not right. He's in the ICU he's walking around, but that's contraindicated or is it? So I think instead of being so obsessive about what we get on our screen and what we get, um, you know, what we get through, uh, all that data and all, the, all those diagnostics, perhaps we need to realize and go back to this, you know, let's diagnose what's physically in front of us. And I think that's how we're going to change and transform, uh, healthcare and, and even just the, uh, the healthcare ecosystem and society, uh, is bringing that element, right? Cause there's, there's internal health, there's all sorts of other areas. And then we cover physical health as physical therapists. Uh, and it's an area that's so far lacking, especially for the baby baby boomers that want to be active, you know, forever and never ever want to go to a quote nursing home, uh, that it's time for us to step up. So you're trained well, you're trained so well, you know, if you're a DPT student right now, you're trained better than I am just because the curriculum has improved that much since I graduated. So I hope it's encouraging to you. I hope it's empowering, you know, and I, I hope that, you know, combined with that, you know, combined with strong mentorship and strong guidance. I think you're set up for success. I really do. You know, instability in the healthcare economics isn't necessarily a bad thing because it means that people that are willing to take initiative are going to be able to plant their stake and build their foundations and just start rising from the ground up. So that turned into a pretty long story time. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll be posting this to my personal blog as well as my YouTube channel later. And uh, I guess that's it for now. If you have any questions, just to let me know, you can, you know, type it down there in the, uh, the section, you know, or you can, uh, I guess it's a good time to I mean, check social media, see if anybody's tweeted me or, or messaged me. Uh, but otherwise, you know, thank you for being with me, uh, just for story time. If you have requests for the future, please let me know. I have a couple other things on my to-do list. I wanted to blab about and load up to YouTube. Um, and yeah, hope you're going to see SM. Let me just check this one more time. Let's see. Doesn't look like anything there. Ooh, got some tweet mentions. And by the way, get on Twitter if you're not on Twitter. It is one of the best ways to connect with fellow professionals. Um, I can't tell you how many people I helped through Twitter uh, or they helped themselves through Twitter to get jobs right out of school. Basically, before school ended, they already had jobs lined up. That's just how the the PT Twitter community is. So, so get on there, right? There's hashtag DPT student, hashtag fresh PT. Uh, there's get PT first, all PT, brand PT, biz PT, you name it. There's all sorts out there. Um, you know, and if you need a crash course, let me know. All right, that's all I have. I will see you guys later. Take care.